uh, so good to to be able to um, record this for you all. And I know that there's a lot of struggle going on right now and a lot of difficulty. I'm here at my in-laws house uh, in my brother's room uh, who doesn't even live here, but um, this is technically his room. And uh, yeah, this is not what we all expected. Obviously last week we were planning on having an Ash Wednesday service, but here we are. Um, and this is Ash Wednesday. This is uh, the kicking off of 40 days of preparation, 40 days of Lent. Um, and this is a, a really important season for us at Church of the Resurrection. It's an important season for Christians all over the world. It's these days of preparation. Uh, we're preparing for uh, Easter, um, to be sure, the Easter season, um, which stretches for uh, 49 days, seven weeks. Um, but uh, we're preparing even as a community for something more. Uh, uh, tangible and physical right in front of us, which is our move to the YMCA and a new season of ministry together. And um, we, we can't talk about preparation. We can't talk about what's next for us if we're not willing to talk about repentance. Um, I've got to tell this story. Uh, two years ago at our Ash Wednesday service, uh, we had a three-year-old boy who, who came up he, he was coming up in, his, in the line to receive his ashes uh, on his forehead, and he was getting a little bit more worked up the closer uh, that he got to the front. And um, he, he wasn't liking the idea of getting ashes uh, put on his his forehead. Like, why would I get dirty on purpose, right? That was his idea, uh, his, his, his thought process. And after receiving the ashes and being told, uh, you know, repent and turn your sin, turn from your sin and turn to Christ, uh, he, he dissolved into tears as he walked away yelling, I don't want to. This was his response. I don't want to. Again, he was he was just not comfortable with getting these ashes rubbed on his forehead. Uh, and so this is this is such a perfect picture of of for us all. Um, repentance is a voluntary uh, dirtying of ourselves. Uh, it's it's this uh, airing out of our sins and admitting our brokenness before others and before God. We have to turn from things we actually really like. A lot of times. Sin, good things, bad things, and we turn to Jesus. We follow Jesus. And on some level, none of us want to do that. Uh, and on ev- actually on the deepest level, none of us are able to do that on our own. Joel prophesies to the nation of Israel um, in, in the passage that you heard read by Father, uh, actually by one of our other readers, um, in Joel 2, this really phenomenal passage of repentance. And he prophesies to the nation of Israel, calling them to repent of their wickedness and to return to the Lord. Why? Why does he call Israel to repent? He says, for the day of the Lord is coming. Well, by this, he means a a day of reckoning, um, a day of judgment for the idolatry, the injustice, and the sin that was in their nation. So he says this by saying, uh, or he he warns them by saying, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. This is is a really uh, urgent call. Why? Well, an enemy nation is actually descending upon Israel to devour and destroy them. Um, the judgment of God is coming through this nation. Uh, and it's a day of darkness. He, this is what Joel says, quote, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The words of Joel 2 make the destruction seem imminent and unavoidable. And this call uh, for repentance, as stark as it sounds, is for us today. The most succinct statement of Christ's message on earth um, in the new covenant was the kingdom of God is at hand, repent, repent. And believe the gospel. This was his message from the beginning and all the way through his ministry. And at the day of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended into heaven uh, and then sent the spirit to dwell in his church, the apostle Peter preached a sermon um, to to, uh, up to 3,000 people we hear in which his final appeal to those listening is repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So today in the church age, even though we're not uh, Israel, we don't have an army descending upon us. The judgment of God isn't coming in that fashion. Today, this call to repent is is just as applicable as ever. You and I must hear the call to repent of our sin. So we get this call to repent. Um, repentance is is part of preparation. It's it it launches um, uh, the season of Lent for us. Well, I want to answer three questions about repentance. We hear this call to repent. So, what is repentance? Number one. Number two, how should I repent? And number three, why should I repent? So what is repentance? How should I repent? Why should I repent? So first, what is repentance? Well, what, it, what, what is the nature of it? Let's look back at Joel 2. 
It's a turning both of our visible and our invisible lives to God, both our actions, uh, our words, our deeds, right? But also our minds and our hearts. So first we turn from sin and those things that have drawn us away to God or from God. So there, there's some kind of sin, there's some kind of idolatry, there's some kind of, of, of lust, there's some kind of something in our lives that has drawn us away from God. So first we turn from that thing. This is what repentance is. And second, we return to God. So this is the back half of turning, right? We're doing a 180 back to our God. In verse 12 of Joel 2, he says, return to me, God says, with all your heart. And again, in verse 13, he says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We return to him and to him alone, for he alone is uh, the truth. Uh, He's the fountain of all goodness. Uh, We must never stop turning from our sin until we've taken a hold of him by faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We don't deserve to be taken back and accepted by him, certainly. Uh, we, we need a mediator, one who can take us to God. So when we turn back to God, we need someone to take us the rest of the way to him. And Jesus Christ is this one. He's the one mediator between God and man. And he's the one who bore his uh, our sin in his body on the tree. Um, he pacified the wrath of God forever and became a, a curse on our behalf. He made once for all time a perfect, sufficient sacrifice for our sins on the cross. And because of this, through faith in him, uh, we can return then to God. And lastly, we must return with all our hearts. This has to be a heartfelt, whole person turning. It can't just be lip service. It can't just be going through the motions. We have to come with with a sincere love and worship of God, desiring to obey and follow him and not our sins. So this is repentance. It's it's turning from uh, sin to God with all of our hearts through um, a mediator. So how should we repent? How, how should we go about this? Um, by what means do we turn from our sin and return to God with our whole heart? So I just described it to you, but what do we do? Well, is it? let's ask these questions. Is it merely an external show of praying, the prayer of confession on Sundays? We pray this every Sunday. Um, is it any action that we can go through, kind of like a magic trick and... Um, make things right between us and God. We just go to a priest and 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 they say a prayer over us and it's done. Or we just uh, do a, do a good thing to make up for it and it's it's over. Well, no, um, that's not true. And in, in in the language of Scripture and, and thus of our liturgy, um, it, it's that of a heartfelt whole person turning to God, like we just said. And there's these four parts that that make it up. Uh, first, there's this contrition of heart. Uh, in in verse twelve of Joel two, which we just read, uh, it says to return with what with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. These are deep uh, uh, feelings of, 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 of mourning and of, of repentance, of sorrow over uh, what we've done and, and who we've been. Uh, and only God can really give us those, those feelings. Only God can really give us that deep inward sorrow for, for sin. And contrition, the word contrition is a good old word that means we feel genuinely sorry and grieved for a wrong we've done. So we have a merciful God who has overwhelmingly blessed us. Even in this time of, of the deep freeze, the freeze of 21, we'll be telling our kids about, gosh, we have so much to be thankful for. We really do. I mean, the fact that we have any recourse at all to, to have heat or, or food or provision or um, uh, emergency services uh, is such a blessing from God. And whenever we sin, we offend against him and against his holy commands. Um, we must mourn and hate these sins. God is not, God does not like sin. And, and so reading and knowing scripture is actually essential to this. The scriptures are honest with us about what kind of people we are and how we've sinned and what God uh, delights in and what God does not delight in. Um, so we must have contrition over our sin based on what God says about who we are and about what he desires. But second, after the contrition of heart, we must then come and confess and acknowledge our sins before God. Uh, when we fully confess to him and we, 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 we say what it is we've done, not hiding anything, he will fully and freely forgive us out of his great mercy and his love. Um, without this confession, the scriptures teach there is no forgiveness of sins. Um, we must... We should and we can confess to one another, as, as, as the letter of James says, especially when there's a wrong done between us, when a particularly difficult sin is weighing on our minds and, 
And maybe doing that alone in the privacy of our rooms isn't enough. We want to go to a pastor. We want to go to someone that we really respect, go to a priest and and confess our sins and to be assured of the forgiveness of God towards us. We can do that. Yet the primary confession commanded and required by God in Scripture is unto him alone through Jesus Christ. Um, this I said, you know, with the words of our mouth, this can be done in silence, obviously, uh, in the heart, because the heart, uh, the confession of the heart is what, what matters. But saying it out loud, there's, there's an extra level of, of, of vulnerability that takes place when we confess to God out loud our sin and we tell him what we've done and that we're sorry for it. So third, we must have faith. Um, and this faith is, is the means by which we apprehend and we take hold of the promises of God towards us. Many of those promises I've already said that God has promised to be merciful to us uh, when we confess, when we repent of our sin. Uh, the the all-holy Lamb of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, did not preserve his own life, didn't save his own life, but gave it up for us. Uh, how then will he not forgive us all of our sin, the scripture tells us? How will he not, so, after such a costly sacrifice, how will he not forgive us? So after we've we've uh, mourned our sin, we've, we've confessed our sin, we've believed in God's promises, what's last? Lastly, we should uh, turn our lives, change our lives, and, and, and having confessed sin and turned to God, we must reflect this turning. And um, John the Baptist said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If we truly repent, we will leave behind our old life and we will follow after God in a new life. So we've, we've learned uh, what repentance is, it's this turning to God. How to repent is to have contrition, to confess, to believe, to, to, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And then why should we repent? Um, everything we've just described may seem daunting or even scary. Uh, why should we go through this? Like what, what is there to gain other than the fact that God commanded us to do it? Well, if you currently stand in sin, something that grievous, something grievous that fills you with guilt or shame or anything uh, like that, you, what motivation can can you find uh, to go to God and to others and confess that that sin um, is there and to find freedom? Look what Joel says about God in Joel two. He's gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger, and he's abounding in steadfast love. He's quicker to forgive you and I than we are to confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We hear also in scripture that this is a faithful saying that Jesus Christ came and died to save sinners, not to save people who have everything put together perfectly. The scriptures also tell us there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He looks favorably and lovingly on all who believe in and cling to him and his son. The reason you should repent is because you have everything to gain and you have God's promise that he will forgive you and restore you when you confess and repent of your sin. In the gospel reading that I, that I started with in the sixth chapter of Matthew, I hear Jesus answering a silent question that echoes in all of us. Um, we ask this question, will I be seen? Will I be delighted in? Will I be cared for? Will I, be, will I be known and appreciated? Well, it's the nature of sin in us to look for these, the answer to these questions in other things, uh, things in this world. Um, we look in the people and things of this world. And it drives us to pride. It drives, it drives us to false performances. It drives us to idolatry and sin. And um, So for instance, in the passage, sounding the trumpet when you give to the poor, or visibly signaling your hunger when you and pain when you're fasting. These are in the, in the passage, fundamentally ploys to garner the recognition and the approval of those around us, right? Um, this may seem like antiquated tactics, like we're not going out in the middle of Parker Square and uh, on the edge of Louisville and like blowing trumpets when we are giving to the poor. Um, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not exactly trendy in our time, right? But similar things do exist for us today. Um, there's no shortage of a performance-based living around us, religious or not. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of ways in, in the public square and on social media to, to signal our, our virtue and our way of living righteously. Uh, and we've seen that, that God actually requires a deeper thing from us. Um, we're not called to perform for God's forgiveness, and we're not called to perform, perform for his approval or the approval of others. We're called to repent. Repentance is fundamentally a, a surrender. It's fundamentally a giving up. Uh, it's a humbling. It's a death. This can be and is rightly signaled by such things as fasting, prayer, 
um, weeping, giving to the poor. Um, and especially as we amend our lives, we will, we will take on new habits that are commanded by God. But let us never forget that to turn to God, confessing our sin and trusting in his mercy is his work in us. We surrender to his mercy and he changes us. We confess our sins, we surrender, we die to ourselves that he might bring new life out of us. And the call of Joel, and Joel 2, and the, and the call of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and of this season of Lent, is to turn to God. Repent of your sin. Flee to the harbor of mercy and grace. Uh, take up these good works of fasting, of, of almsgiving, of prayer, uh, but walk in them out of an overflow of the life of God that's already in you, knowing that your heavenly Father sees you and acknowledges you, and he approves of you on account of his Son, Jesus Christ. Let's prepare through repentance today and for the next 40 days of Lent. God bless you guys. Hope to see you soon.